Hey everybody, welcome to Marine Mammals. Uh, we are continuing on with the very last of our talks about invertebrates, invertebrates, and the taxonomy. So you guys are basically done with organisms after this, and then we're gonna be getting on to ecosystems next. So, just a reminder, we are in the phylum chordata, the subphylum vertebrata, and we are in the class mammalia. So we've moved away from the reptiles and the mammals, sorry, the reptiles and the birds to the mammals. One thing I would like to uh, mention before we get started is we did not talk about the class amphibia. And I can't exactly see if anyone's raising their hands, but if anyone knows, are there any marine amphibians? Any at all? Anywhere in the world? There are not. So amphibians actually do diffusion of water and oxygen and stuff directly through their skin. And so because of that, if they were to live in the marine environment, they would be diffusing salt constantly, and that would just dehydrate their entire system. So no, there are no marine amphibians anywhere in the world. So that may be a test question, I don't know. But you know what there are? Lots of marine mammals, like this little fat squish squish. So that's what we're gonna get started on today. And I'm sure a lot of you guys, marine mammals are your favorite part of the semester. So you are in luck because we're finally here at marine mammals. So let's go ahead and get started. So here is the taxonomy. Remember, we're in the class mammalia. We have a couple different orders. We have the order Carnivora, the suborder Panopedia, the order Sirena, and the order Cetacea. So then we're going to be talking about the different groups that fall under each one of these. But the carnivores are things like your sea otters, your polar bears. They also include the seals and sea lions as well, but they're in their suborder known as the pinnipeds, or the seals and sea lions. We have the sirenas, which are the dugongs and the manatees. Um, you can think of like a siren in Spanish means mermaid. Dugongs and manatees were actually mistaken for mermaids way back in the day, which is why they're all in the order under sirena. Um, the order cetacea are going to be any of your cetaceans, your whales, your dolphins, and your porpoises. And we're going to talk about the differences between the two different types of whales and the difference between whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Okay, so let's talk about all mammals. What do all mammals have? What do we all have? Well, first thing we all have is we all have hair. And you're like, wait a minute, that whale does not have hair. In fact, it does. It's just greatly reduced. So all mammals have hair. That's a classic character, uh, characterization of mammals. They're all homeotherms, meaning we can control our internal body temperature. Unlike those amphibians we learned about, right? They have to sit outside and sunbathe to get warm, but we don't. We can actually control our internal body temperature with because we are homeotherms, and all mammals are. Um, most of them are viviparous, meaning we give live birth. Can anyone think of a mammal that doesn't give live birth? The platypus, that is correct. The platypus is one of those weirdos that kind of looks like a bird and a mammal had a baby and it's in an egg. So the platypus is one of the few organisms that actually have um, lay eggs. But there's also placental growth. We do, not placental. Um, uh, there's also um, marsupial pouches. So they give live birth, but then they keep them in the little marsupial pouches like kangaroos and stuff. So that's slightly different, but most of them are straight up viviparous, meaning we lay live birth. We have live birth, we lay live birth. We have live birth. We all have mammary glands. Um, you can think of mammary glands as kind of uh, like how your mom used to feed you, right? Different than nipples, their mammary glands are used for the milk. And uh, we do have very large brains. This should not shock you guys because you are in college, but that little mouse is not, right? Well, mouse is a mammal. We are in college. Uh, We do have very large brains compared to some of the other organisms. Like if you think of a bird, their brains are very, very small. Same thing with a fish. But all mammals uh, comparatively have larger brains, and that's why we do have things like complex social statuses, even amongst um, dolphins and chimpanzees and stuff like that. They have social interactions, they have social structures, they have family units, uh, and that is all due to our very large brains. And all of us are going to be sexually dimorphic. Not every single mammal, but just about going to be sexually dimorphic, meaning the males are going to look different than the females. And we've already seen that so far in some fishes, but mammals are very, very common. Now getting to our first of the carnivores, these are sea otters. And most of you guys don't think of sea otters as carnivores, but they are. I mean, they are meat eaters. They are going out and they're either hunting clams or urchins. And what they do is they grab them and they put them on their little bellies as they're floating and they smash them with a rock. Yeah, tool, using tools. That's because of that big old brain that they have. Uh, another thing that they have, which humans have wanted and hunted for the last 200 years, is their very thick, dense fur. They have the thickest fur in the animal kingdom, and that's because they don't have blubber, right? Well, unlike all the other marine mammals that we're going to see that have all this blubber that keeps them nice and warm, otters do not. 
So they're relatively thin body, but they do have this very dense fur. And this fur also is kind of oily, just like the birds. So the water rolls right off of it, keeping them and their insides very nice and warm and almost protected and dry compared to the actual water. So if you see a sea otter swim, you can actually see little bubbles coming off of him because that's air trapped in that very, very dense fur. However, that dense fur is the reason that they were overhunted for very many, many, many years because people wanted that fur to the point where they almost went extinct. This is what's shifting all of our community ecosystems like the kelp forest that we're going to learn about. They've all communities kind of shifted a little bit because we're missing our otters, we're missing our top predators. And in that case, the kelp forest, the, key, the keystone predators are these otters. You remove the otters, the urchins go crazy because otters eat urchins, and then urchins eat kelp, and now there's no kelp forest. So nobody has a home because we remove these otters. So very, very important. Uh, they're very dexterous. I'm sure you guys have seen them as they swim around. They're little four hind flippers. They're four flippers. They can grasp stuff like little tiny rocks, and they're going to bash stuff with it. Absolutely adorable, but really functional as well. Um, these guys are really, really great feeders, and that's pretty much all they're doing. They're almost like hummingbirds. They have these really high metabolisms, again, to keep themselves warm. So they're constantly just eating. They're just diving and eating and then laying on their back, napping, diving and eating, laying on their back, napping. Very, very, uh, uh, they keep very active, let's just say the least. Uh, the males are going to be slightly larger than the females. That's not always true. A lot of the times in nature, the females are going to be larger than the males, and that's because the females have to take care of the babies. Uh, but in these guys, the males are going to be slightly larger. Now, I'm sure you guys know what sea otters look like, but I totally just had to because they're so cute. Um, they do also have complex behaviors like almost every single mammal does, including they keep their babies on their bellies to keep them nice and warm when they're growing and they're um, to still baby juveniles. Uh, and they also sleep holding hands so they don't drift apart from each other because they do sleep just usually embedded in a kelp forest somewhere just on the top of the water. And so they hold hands with each other so they don't drift away which is just, I mean, come on, adorable. All right, so these guys are eating. They have a very, very high metabolic rate, higher than most again, because they're trying to stay warm. They eat all the time, and they're just eating lots and lots of food. So these guys are actually not very big. You know, otters are probably about this big, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, but they're eating about 20 pounds of food a day. So imagine a sea otter that weighs maybe 40, 50 pounds. He's eating almost half of his body weight in a single day. And that's because like hummingbirds, he's burning it off like crazy. So they need to constantly keep consuming in um, nutrients and energy. They do eat things like sea urchins, crabs, mussels, abalones, octopus. They really like the shellfish because they can use tools. All they have to do is grab that little rock and bash it and now they can have the delicious clam on the inside. Whereas a lot of these fishes and stuff don't have hands and therefore can't just grab it, use a tool and break it up. So these guys are eating a lot of the things that other organisms can't eat. Um, most of the times they are opportunistic, they'll eat what's there, but they usually have preferences. So they'll usually try to go for the good stuff that they particularly like, depending on the species of sea otter. Up next on our carnivores are the polar bears. These guys are fascinating. They are the largest carnivore on the planet, even larger than brown bears, because actually they used to be brown bears. So a long, long time ago, a group of northern brown bears started to move farther and farther up north. And then through evolution, the lightest of the bears actually started doing better because they could kind of blend into the snow better. And then the whole population shifted to only white. Fun fact though, polar bears are not white. Polar bear skin is actually black and their fur is translucent, meaning kind of opaque, like you can kind of see through, but not really, right? But it has no pigment. So they lost their pigment, they lost that brown pigmentation over years and years and years through evolution, and now they actually have translucent fur. So if you ask someone what color is the fur of a polar bear and they say white, it's wrong, it's translucent. Um, they can see the black skin. Um, I have an amazing drawing of a polar bear if you guys want to see it. Yeah, okay. That's a polar bear with his eyes closed. Get it? Because it's just the nose, because that's all you can see because he's playing. <laughs> I know, you have to have my terrible jokes while you guys are at home. What else are you gonna do? Okay, um, these guys do have, if you actually compare them to regular bears or brown bears, they have smaller ears 
and longer necks. So the smaller ears is actually, this is where animals actually do a lot of their um, heat control. So we actually lose a lot of heat out of our heads. Animals do the same thing with the ears. If you've ever seen a dog who's hot, he'll perk his ears up as he pants to try to keep himself cool. Right? Well, this is if you're trying to keep yourself cool, if you're trying to keep yourself warm, you want to have really, really, really tiny ears because you don't want to lose any of that heat off your head. You want to keep your ears and your head nice and warm. So that's why they have smaller ears. Um, they do have longer necks mostly for the feeding and the hunting and sticking their heads in between like snow and ice and trying to get to find out their prey and stuff like that. Um, and again, um, again, some like the other carnivores we've seen so far, the males are going to be larger than the females. Sadly, with the polar bears, they are losing a lot of their habitat. Now, it's not just habitat loss that they're losing, it's also their feeding mechanism, because a lot of the times when these guys are feeding, they'll kind of wait near a hole for a seal to pop out to take a breath, because that's what they're feeding on, and then they'll bash them and grab them and eat them. But if there's no openings or no holes because there's all melted ice and it's just ocean, then they kind of lose their mechanism of feeding. Now, this isn't their only way of feeding, but it is a type of feeding. And and the rest of it is, if you used to live on this big iceberg that's no longer there, you're now having to swim to the next iceberg. And these guys can't swim. In fact, they can swim hundreds of miles. But they really aren't supposed to, so they're burning a lot of calories as they swim to try to get from one iceberg to the other to even just take a break. So it's actually really sad because they're losing their home as these ice caps melt. Um, and this is part of global warming, and this is a big issue because these polar bears could essentially go extinct in your lifetime and most probably will, which is because they're awesome. If you've ever seen one in person, they're just stunning and gorgeous and massive, massive. Well, I know that's not it, <laughs> but mid, mid dad joke. I've heard of something. All right, so we're now getting to the uh, suborder, the Pinnipedia, right, which are your seals and sea lions. Not like this sea lion. More like this sea lion. That's who we got right here. Now, you will have to know the difference between seals and sea lions, but I'm going to walk you guys through it, and it's actually pretty simple. One thing you can see with the seal is, sorry, the sea lion, is he is propping himself up with his four flippers. Sea lions can do this. Seals cannot. Right? So if you've ever been to a show where a sea lion sits up and gives you a little kiss with his long neck, that's going to be a sea lion. The other thing you can notice is he has these two little ear flaps right here. Those ear flaps allow him, well, basically, seals ha do not have them, but sea lions do. Um, sea lions have that long, turnable neck, where seals don't. They kind of look like these short, little, fat, you know, guys. These guys are actually pretty good on land. They can do this kind of little walk. Where seals can't, they kind of have to warm it. Oh, and they look really funny doing it. And that's what you can see right here. Notice we have no ear flaps, right? We do not have an elongated neck. We cannot prop ourselves up on our fore flippers. So these guys are using their hind flippers as propulsion, and their fore flippers are pretty much just directing them where they're going. Um, and again, stubby little neck and the big fat little round guy was like this. Some more differences between the two. Again, you can clearly see when you put them right next to each other. Long neck, ear flaps, no neck, no ear flaps, big distinguished fore flippers, very small fore flippers. Um, these guys propel, propel themselves mostly with their fore flippers. These guys propel themselves mostly with their hind flippers. So that's some of the differences between the two. Now, most people say, oh, well, sea lions are always bigger than seals. That is not true. Uh, if you actually look up elephant seals, elephant seals are the largest of the seals, and they are way larger than the California sea lion, getting up to 12 feet and sometimes bigger than that. They're really, really, really big. Um, we had a trip scheduled to San Simeon for my field trip class. I'm so sorry but you guys still might be able to go on your own at some point in our lives when this is over. Yay. All right, um, here's a video I want you guys to watch on the elephant seals of San Simeon. They used to have some amazing uh, mating behaviors. They do have harems. So again, just like the sheep head that we learned about, the male kind of controls the female population. So there'll be one master, what's called a beach master, and he controls all the females on his beach. And then if another juvenile tries to fight him, they literally will come up and they will start fighting each other. Now they have these big sh noses, which is why they're called elephant seals, but they also have a lot of fat around their necks. And so these guys can actually walk a little bit better on land and they will kind of throw their heads into each other and use their fangs to kind of slash at each other. Now they don't really want to hurt each other, 
because they're just competing for females. So it's kind of just like they smash at each other, smash at each other, and then when one gets tired, he'll just leave. However, sometimes they actually do kill each other, and it can actually get really, really brutal. In fact, a lot of times you see the males, they'll have scars all the way down their neck, and if it's mating season, you'll see fresh, bloody scars all the way down their neck. Um, this video is not that graphic, so please, please, please do take a look at this video, guys, on your own. All right, walruses. Next up are walruses. Walruses are absolutely massive. They usually live up in the cold waters, which is why they're so massive, because they have all of that blubber. Um, they do have lots of what's called vibrisae, and these vibrisae are known as the whiskers. So they have really pronounced vibrisae because they are bottom feeders, and they're actually going to be hunting down, and they're looking for little mollusks and shellfish that are hidden in the sand. So those whiskers, or those vibrisae, are used for filtering kind of through that soft sediment on the bottom, looking for their food. Now, most of the time when you see a walrus, you see those long tusks, and you go, oh, that must be a male. In this case, both male and females have these tusks but the males usually will be slightly larger in size and their tusks will be slightly longer, but both males and females will have them. Now they have both uh, fore flippers and hind flippers modified into these actual flippers so that they can swim and they are pretty good at swimmers, but most of the time they're spending time on land just kind of being lazy. Um, the males are gonna be slightly larger than the females and they do have larger and thicker tusks like I just mentioned. Um, they can rotate their pelvises actually pretty well, and that's to kind of prop themselves up and lay there or to, you know, engage in some sexual play, which is true because these are mammals and they do have copulation um, for reproduction. And so in this case, what they do is they'll actually just lay there and kind of rotate their pelvises at each other and then just do their business and then just rotate back. And it makes sense if you have a walrus who weighs over a ton, you don't want a ton walrus getting on another ton walrus and then just like, Oh my God, you break each other. So that's why they have those rotating hips, not only for propping themselves up on land and looking all cute and posing for pictures, but for the rotating and the mating. So rotate, another fun sex fact, guys. Walruses have rotating hips for intercourse. Fine. And this is exactly what you can see right here. Big old walrus, long tusk. He's actually sitting with the rest of his body here. He's rotated himself so that his legs are over here, but he's propping himself over here. So they do have really great rotating hips. Here's another really cool video. This is actually kind of an amazing video of how scientists have to work in the wild. And even these poor guys are like, oh, we didn't get the shot. Oh, things went wrong. And that's totally true of actual science. So field work science is super fun. It's really hard. And most of the time it does not go the way you want it to. But it's great. You're out, you know, you're on a boat, you're in the beautiful wilderness. It's just amazing. So go ahead and check out this video, guys, because we can also see how they feed, which is really cool. Now, moving on to the sirenas. Okay, so these are your manatees and your dugongs. You will also need to know the difference between manatees and dugongs. Okay, so they do have this streamlined body, kind of like the walrus, this big rotund body. Um, but they are gray in color. Sometimes they appear kind of a brownish gray. Sometimes they're actually a little bit of green. That's because they actually can be covered in algae, um, like this guy right here. These guys usually are found in tropical waters. Like if you go to Florida, they're actually pretty common where my dad lives. Um, these guys are really awesome. They're always like kind of coming up to the boat, checking out what we, what we are. They're pretty curious, but they're also really slow moving. And unfortunately, because they are such slow movers, um, what happens is if a boat comes flying by, and they can't get down deep enough, what happens is their back actually gets cut up with these propellers. And a lot of times you'll see on the back of these guys, you can almost see it here, these are lines. that go this way and this way and this way because they're being constantly run over by these boats. And so there's a lot of times, especially in the Florida waters, when they say slow for manatees, slow, pay attention to where you're going. Um, and I make my dad, anytime I see any, anything that I might be a manatee, I make him kill the engine real quick just so we don't hurt one. Um, luckily their numbers are coming back they did take a big toll a few years ago, but their numbers are coming back, so we're starting to see the back of the bay again, which is, which is pretty great. Um, I did see, and this hasn't been documented, but I did see what I think is a mating behavior. There were two, two adults, definitely two adults, and they were swimming next to each other, and what I believed was the male was kind of like poking and prodding at the female, and he was green and covered like this, but she was completely gray, and I noticed him like nibbling on her, and what I think it was almost kind of like, He's almost like kind of poking and prodding her, like, hey, baby, hey, come on, go on a date with me, go on a date with me, come on, let's go mate. 
Um, and so he's actually kind of like nibbling at her and actually nibbled off all the algae off of her. It was the craziest thing I'd never seen it before and it's actually not documented. So we don't know a lot about these mating behaviors, but that might be something that they do. Kind of like the fish that we learned about, poking, poking at the female to let her know that he's ready. This may be the same kind of thing. The male was kind of like chasing her and harassing her. Maybe so that he could mate with her. I don't know, maybe he was just a jerk, I don't know. But it hasn't been documented yet, but maybe it'll be the first, I don't know. Now manatees are herbivores. They are spending their time basically eating sea grasses, which is why they like those tropical shallow waters. Um, a lot of times they're just eating any kind of algae or grasses that they can get their hands on because there's not a ton of food for them in the tropics. Sometimes they will if they have to switch to fish or clams. So they are omnivores, but mostly herbivores eating those algae. Um, and they do consume about anywhere between five and 10% of their body weight. Now you might not think that's a lot, but if you weigh hundreds of pounds, maybe you're eating 20, 30 pounds of algae a day. Algae does not weigh a lot. That's eating a lot. So again, these guys are spending majority of their day just kind of swimming around finding food. Now, this is a manatee right here. This is a dugong. Now, dugongs and manatees are both in the order Sirenia, um, but they are very different from each other. This guy kind of has a very flat mouth right here. This guy has a much more rounder snout. Um, they're about the same size. They live in about the same places. But here are some key characteristic differences. The manatee kind of has, again, that rounder face, not that blunt, short snout like you can see right here. It almost looks like a vacuum cleaner, right? Whereas this guy has nice, round, big little teeth. Um, this guy has smooth skin. This guy kind of has rough skin, if you were to pet him. Not like rough like a shark, but a little bit kind of like hard leather, like imagine like a dried out leather couch kind of thing. Um, the tails are also the most noticeable difference. So this guy has a mermaid tail, and this guy has a big rotund tail. So can you imagine if you were a sailor out at sea and you hadn't seen a woman in like a year, right? And then this thing kind of swims by you and you're like, what is that, is that a girl? Oh my God, it's kind of got some hips and you know, kind of got a smile and a little fishy tail, yeah. So dugongs and manatees were, again, believed to be the reason that we think mermaids exist because sailors were kind of losing their mind with scurvy out on these boats for months at a time. And then they would see this mammal kind of poke its head up and be like, oh, I don't know what that is, but you know what sailors want to do if they haven't seen a woman in forever. Yeah, it's crazy. But this is where we got the idea of that mermaid's tail. It's from the dugongs. So this is what we based it off of, which is pretty cool. All right, moving on to our whales, our cetaceans, right? Whales, dolphins, and porpoises. These guys do not have those forelimbs, right? They are modified into the little flippers that you guys can see. They do have a tail. It is not a caudal fin because they are not fish. It is known as a fluke. So as you have that whale who dives down, right? They kind of come up with that tail that is known as a fluke. You can actually identify different whales based on the size and shape of their fluke as well as their blowhole. So depending if they have one blowhole or two, and the shape that the spout actually comes out, you can identify the species of whale. Uh, people had to do this because back in the day, we didn't have scuba diving equipment or, you know, a or AUVs that we could just send out and be like, hey, go monitor this whale for a while. We didn't know what it was, so we had to learn how to do this just on the little tiny glimpses of the whale that we got. Um, their nostrils are not located here. Their nostrils are located here. That is their blowhole. Okay, so their blowhole is a nostril. Right? It's just modified to be way up here. And that's because all they have to do, instead of sitting there face up and going <gasps> to take a breath, all they have to do is kind of get their head up there or their back region up there and they breathe through that. And so that's what you see that spout, right? They spout because they're exhaling and then they breathe it in. And that's their inhale. And that is known as the blowhole. Here's a bunch of different types of whales. Uh, we already talked about this guy right here. This is the sperm whale. Remember, you can always tell the sperm whale because it has that big head right there, that big distinct melon. They have the largest melon of all the, the dolphins and whales and cetaceans because they're the deepest divers, because they're hunting giant squid. And those giant squid are way down at the bottom. So remember, they're gonna ping them with that echo echolocation. They're gonna be able to zoom into that one, dive all the way down, grab them, and then go back up. Sperm whales, super cool. Narwhals. Narwhals are the unicorns of the sea with that giant beak. That giant beak is actually a modified tooth. Yeah, a tooth grew out your face and like seven feet long. It's crazy. We actually are still not even sure what the narwhal tooth is used for. 
Um, it's called a tusk, but it is a tooth. Um, we're not really sure what it's used for. It's not used for male-male fighting. It's not used for competition. They think it might be used in some kind of feeding, but they're definitely not spearing their prey with it with their faces. So we're not exactly 100% sure why they have them. The belugas, the big old white whales, again, super easy to identify. You have things like the common dolphins. We have common dolphins out here. We have spinner dolphins. We have harbor porpoises. We have lots of different things out here in California. Um, like the spinner dolphins, they're all called spinner dolphins because they will jump and spin. It's like they're show-offs, seriously. Uh, we have fiquitas and porpoises, which are, again, the same. They're not true dolphins. They are porpoises. Killer whales, which we've already learned about, right, with the counter shading, very obvious. Um, and we have so many other different types of whales that we have off our coast. We have grays, we have blues, we have humpbacks. Again, humpbacks are very easy to recognize because they are the ones with the big white bellies and the big white fins. But let's talk about the different types of whales, right? We have two groups of whales. We have the toothed whales, the odontocetes. Remember, odontus, right, means teeth, like, or orthodontist, right? That means teeth. They have a single blowhole. The baleen whales, so <laughs> the differences between tooth, dolph uh, tooth whales and baleen whales, one, they have teeth, and two, they have a single blowhole. Uh, the baleen whales are the mysticetes. They have baleen instead of teeth. These are the filter feeders, guys, and they have two blowholes instead of one. So all you'd have to do is really look at the mouth. Do they have teeth? They're gonna be in odontoceti. Do they have baleen, mysticeti? Or look at them up top. Do they have one? It's going to be a dodge study. Do they have two? It's going to be a mist study. Uh, the mist studies, let's talk about them first. The baleen whales. They do have baleen. Baleen is modified teeth. It's kind of like cartilage, like your ear. So it's flexible, bendable, yet hard and rigid. And so what they do is they kind of lay all these baleen layers down and down and down so they can filter the water in and then filter out things like the krill and the copepods, small fishes, small invertebrates, whatever they need to feed on. Because remember, these are big, big whales. The largest whale in the world is a blue whale, and it is a baleen feeder, right? It is a mysticeti. So that big, big whale got that big eating things like krill, which are microscopic, and copepods. Um, so yeah, we have the right whales, the gray whales, the, uh, baleen, the blue whales, and the humpback whales. One thing that all these whales have and that's something that you can see right here. So this is my fin whale. What you can see is these lines. These lines going down the throat are called, are called rorqual. Rorqual means pleated, right? Pleated throat. And a pleated throat, kind of like a pleated skirt, allows it to open up. Same kind of thing here. So normally they just have them closed like this, but what they do is when they open their mouth, they allow all of this water in. Kind of like the guler pouch of the pelican we learned about, right? They expand this throat, that roar will expands open. So they can gobble huge amounts of water, then they filter out the rest of the water and then they keep in all of these, those small invertebrates that they're trying to eat. So easy to identify any of the mysticetes, right? You see the baleen, gotta be a mysticeti. Or you see the roar quill, gotta be a mysticeti because the other odontocetes don't have that. Uh, oops. There we go. This is the rorqual that I was talking about, the pleading in the throat right here. Okay, so that allows them to kind of keep it closed or open it up and expand it so they can gulp in these huge amounts of water. Uh, we do have the double blowholes up on top. Remember, two blowholes, it's gonna be a mysticeti. Um, we have the flippers, we have the fluke. Yes, they have dorsal fins, they're usually pretty small. And again, this is another great way that we can actually identify some of these is based on the shape and how they roll as they roll um, and come up for air. Now let's get into the toothed whales. And the first thing that comes up are the dolphins and the porpoises. These are whales, yes. There is no difference between a toothed whale and a dolphin. Okay, now there are dolphins and porpoises, but they're all under the toothed whale family. Okay, so we have the beak whales, we have the blue boats, the narwhals, the sperm whales, the river dolphins, and the porpoises. Okay, these are found in tropical waters, they're found in cold waters, they're found in lakes, or sorry, not lakes, but rivers. Rivers and streams are the river dolphin. In fact, they just found a pink albino river dolphin. Did you see that? Google it, pink albino river dolphin. Man, that's a sight, pink dolphin. Uh, these guys do have what's called 
conical teeth if you are a dolphin, spade teeth if you are a porpoise. Conical means cone shaped. Okay, kind of looks like a spear, like that. And that's for the biting, the grasping, the pulling, the shredding. Okay, porpoises can call a spade tooth or a flattened crushing tooth. And that's again because they're not grasping at things, they're more like crushing things like invertebrate or shell organisms. Okay, so on the left, right, your right, whatever, this one right here, this is a porpoise. Okay, and then we have a dolphin. Notice the shape of the nose. Okay, this big rounded beak right here, they almost have no snout, whereas the dolphin is a very distinct nose area right here, a very distinct little snout right here. So very, very different. Typically, porpoises are smaller than dolphins, but again, you don't usually want to go by just size. Here are some other classic differences. Okay, so we see the, the beak business right here, the round business right here. These guys have a very pointed, almost triangular dorsal fin. These guys almost have a rounded, a little bit kind of stouter and shorter. Um, what else? These guys are larger, these guys are smaller. The shaped teeth, again, conical is going to be for the um, dolphins. Spade or flat is going to be for the porpoises. So definitely know the differences between um, porpoises and dolphins. Here are a bunch of common dolphins and porpoises we have off our coast. A lot, a lot of dolphins. So most people go, oh, Flipper. Flipper was a bottlenose dolphin. We have common dolphins off our coast and spinner dolphins, um, as well as a bunch of these. We had a Rhesus dolphin the last time we went whale washing. Super rare, it was really, really cool to see that. So yeah, anytime you go whale watching or dolphin watching, don't just say, oh, it's a dolphin. There's a lot of different species of dolphin. Now I have a question for you. We just learned about the differences between dolphins and porpoises, but we haven't really talked about whales yet. Well, does that mean that all the, the uh, odontocetes are dolphins? All the whales are dolphins? All the dolphins are whales? So let's ask a question about this guy. Okay, so this is a killer whale. But is this whale a dolphin? First of all, look at the shape of the dorsal fin. Look at the shape of the mouth. It is a dolphin. So technically, when, even though they are named killer whales, they're actually dolphins. So they're all in the Odontoceti family, the tooth whale family, but these guys are actually considered dolphins. Now they were named whales because when they were first discovered, they were larger than dolphins, much larger, so they were about whale size. And they were also seen like voraciously eating a bunch of things. Seals, sea lions, penguins, just they just eat everything. And therefore they were actually called killer whales um, by mistake. So they are actually dolphins and in the family Delphinidae. So it's pretty cool. Uh, here's a different video of whales and dolphins feeding. They're actually feeding together. This is kind of like that group commensalism where they're all working to get, sorry, group mutualism where they're all working together to get food. So they kind of have the dolphins and the whales and they get a ball up that bait ball and they're all going to start darting through it. It's actually fascinating, so don't forget to watch this video at home. Guys, it's got some really, really good stuff on it. Now remember how I said you can identify these whales um, from their spouts? Either from the spouts themselves, from their dorsal fin, or from their fluke. So here's a bunch of common dolphins, or sorry, common whales that we have off of our coast. And you can actually learn how to identify them. Um, and unfortunately, this is something that we were going to do on my field trip class. So if you're in the field trip class, I'm sorry for you. Um, hopefully, you guys will still get to do this in the future. So this is a really great, if you want to kind of screenshot this, keep it to your phone. So anytime you're going out on a whale watching thing, you can be like, oh yeah, that's a gray whale. That's a gray whale. And you can identify them hopefully before the boat people do. So that'd be super fun for you. I'm not going to make you identify any of these. I might make you identify some common whales, some of the ones that we've seen, like uh, blue whales, humpback whales, uh, sperm whales, obviously orcas, narwhals, belugas, those are all really easy. I'm not going to make you, any of the hard ones, I'm not going to make you guys do. But know some of the common whale species, especially the ones that are common here on our coast. All right, so next we have to talk about how these mammals can do what they do. How does that sperm whale take a single breath and dive 3,000 feet, sorry, 3,000 meters, 9,000 feet to the bottom of the ocean to hunt that giant squid and then stay down there while he's hunting him and killing him and brown and come up and how do they do this? This is something actually that all mammals have, including you. It's called 
apneustic breathing. And essentially what happens is when your temples are submerged underwater for more than 30 seconds, your heart rate drops. This is how free divers can hold their breath for over six minutes. And you're like, people can't do that, people can do that. Right? It's because we all have this, we're all mammals, we all have this inside of us. So it's something, it's called a mammalian diving response. Sorry, we're not to quite mix the apneastic breathing yet. It's called a mammalian diving response, is where your um, heart rate will actually slow as soon as your temples are submerged. I did this in my animal physiology class. We had to sit there and stick our face in a bucket for like a minute, and you can hear it's the craziest thing. Once you learn to get over that first 30 seconds of, oh, I'm gonna drown, you start to relax, and this is what free divers will tell you, your, your heart rate will drop. That is your body's response to conserve oxygen. If your heart rate's beating like this, the oxygen in your system is gonna get used up really quickly. If it starts to slow down and is not breathing to this, then you can actually keep that oxygen in your system for a lot longer before you run out of oxygen. Before they actually do that deep dive, they do what's called apneustic breathing, which is something you see swimmers do sometimes. They go <sighs> <sighs> Essentially what you're doing is you're oxygenating your system. You're trying to get as much oxygen into your system as you can. You don't want to just take <gasps> right? One breath isn't going to do it. You want to breathe. You kind of want to like do this rapid breathing, almost like a hyperventilation kind of thing like that, and that's going to increase the amount of oxygen already in your system. Then when you hold your breath and you go through that mammalian diving response, your heart rate slows, you still have all that oxygen in your system. Uh, another thing they have is they have elastic tissues in their lungs. So when we take a breath and we go, <gasps> that's pretty much all we got. When they take a breath, it's <gasps> right? They can actually expand their lungs really, really big and really far to get even more oxygen. So we can do this, we can kind of train ourselves to do this and increase our lung capacity, but really these guys don't have to. They have all that elastic material inside of them that allows them to just really grow their lungs super big, and that allows them to take that really big breath in and then keep as much oxygen. So between that, the apneustic breathing and the mammalian diving response, these guys are really, really good at what they do. A third thing, that the real reason they are so good, and again, this could be an easy test question, just saying, why they can dive and stay down so long is not only are they doing this rapid breathing, not only does their heart rate slow down, but they actually have more blood than we do. So we actually don't have that much blood. I think we have like, like five or six liters or something like that. Um, uh, we have to have more than that. <laughs> These guys have a lot more, so therefore they have a lot more hemoglobin. Remember that hemoglobin is the oxygen-carrying pigment in blood. It's what turns it red. So if you have more blood, you have more hemoglobin, you have more oxygen-carrying pigments. When they're doing that breathing, right, they expand their lungs really, really big, and they breathe rapidly, breathe rapidly. Now all those little oxygen is picked up by all the hemoglobin that they have. Therefore, when they hold their breath and they dive down there and they drop their heart rate, they already have all the uh, necessary ingredients for success. So, uh, they also, one last thing, they have so many things. <laughs> they also have more myoglobin in their muscles. So just kind of like the hemoglobin carries oxygen, Myoglobin does the same thing, but this is now in your muscles. Your muscles need oxygen. When you're swimming and you're swimming and you're swimming, you're burning up a lot of that oxygen. Okay, you're doing cellular respiration to get yourself moving to create that energy you need. So all that oxygen is gonna disappear pretty quickly. So luckily in your muscles, they have this myoglobin, which allows them to store even more oxygen in the muscles themselves. So they can still go through that cellular respiration. So they don't you know, cramp up and start fermenting and producing that lactic acid. Right, they can actually keep going because they already, the muscles have their own supply of oxygen. Uh, by dropping your heart rate, you actually reduce the blood flow to the extremities so you don't need to waste it on your little toe if you're not using your little toe, or whatever the dolphins are using. Right, they don't need to waste it, so they slow the heart rate down, they slow their circulation down, and again, less oxygen gets used as they dive. Um, ah. When they're diving, not only are their lungs expandable outwards, but their ribs are actually contractile. So they will actually force those lungs and those rib cages smaller and smaller and smaller, which will push, push out, push, which will push out more of that oxygen, making it readily available for them. So they make sure they get absolutely all of them out. So they condense it, because again, remember pressure, oxygen, and all the air is going to combine and combine and combine and get really, really small. So what they do is they essentially push it for even farther to make sure they get that last little bit of oxygen out of their system. 
So this is what we see right here. We see nice, big, elastic -y lungs. They're doing that optimistic breathing. They're breathing and breathing and breathing and breathing. They expand their lungs super, super, super big. Thanks to all that blood that they have, they have all that extra oxygen carried. Thanks to the myoglobin in their muscles, they have all that oxygen still there. When they dive down, right, they're going to contract their ribs, contract their lungs, push it, push on it, releasing any of that excess oxygen out of it and making it um, and increase the, uh, decrease the blood flow around their system while increasing the amount of oxygen. Um, by the way, the reduction of the heart rate, the mammalian diving response is called bradycardia. B-R-A-D-Y-C-A-R-D-I-A, -A -A, bradycardia. That's your mammalian diving response. It's basically when you drop your heart rate after 30 seconds of your tumble being submerged. And you can try this at home if you have some kind of way of measuring your heart rate while you're underwater. Echolocation, I know we've already talked about it a little bit when we talked about those sperm whales, but these guys are really, really great at it. Now, when it comes to mysticity, meaning the baleen whales, they don't really need to do a lot of echolocation. So their melons, the part that does echolocation, are greatly reduced. In fact, their heads look a little bit flatter and more almost streamlined like that, instead of being kind of like a big head, like where your brain would be for the echolocation because it's really only the tooth whales that are actually pointing out an individual target and chasing after it to go get that one. So think of the sperm whale, right? Big old massive melon, because he's targeting that one individual giant squid and he's gonna go grab that one and go and eat him. When you're talking about a baleen whale, they're just swimming around looking for krill. So essentially all they do is, do is open their mouth and they can filter a bunch of their food. So they're not pinging anyone. They're not tar targeting anybody specifically. So that's why they're greatly reduced. Another way you can tell the difference between a toothed whale and a baleen whale is again, the toothed whales are always gonna have the bigger melons because they're doing the echolocation to find their food. Um, so essentially what they're doing is they send out a series of sounds, usually in little clicks and ticks and you've heard dolphins talk, right? So what they're doing is they're sending out these sound frequencies in the form of waves. And remember sound travels in waves through the water and as it hits something, it's actually going to hit and it's going to, the sound waves are going to bounce back. They travel until they hit something and then they're going to bounce and repel back. That's actually what they pick up. And they pick it up in their lower jaw. So they send a series of clicks and noises out. The noises travel, hit something, bounce back, and then they actually pick up the vibrations in their jaw, which sends it to their brain. So it's received by the melon in the lower jaw and then a signal is sent to their brain. Now the longer it takes this signal to come back to them, the farther away the object is. Which makes sense, right? If I ping something that's right here, it's going to go bounce back. But if I ping something and then it's going to come all the way back, it's going to take some time. So that's how, again, they can tell how far away it is. Is it worth it for me to go all the way over there to get some food or is there some food closer around? So here's an amazing video of how this actually works. Um, in fact, this one I might actually show you guys right now. Let's see if we can. In basic terms, a dolphin's echolocation works like this. The animal produces a series of low and high frequency sounds that are transmitted through its forehead. After these sonic waves hit an object, echoes bounce back. The greater the distance, the longer the delay in their return. When the dolphin receives the reflected signals, it forms a mental image of the target's location, size, and speed. When they're chasing a fish, they'll go into a huge school of fish and they'll zero in on one fish. And they'll follow that single fish until they catch it. And, and if that fish jumps out of the water, they're right there jumping out of the water with it. Echolocation requires several component parts, each designed for a specific function. When integrated, they form the most efficient sonar system on Earth, natural or man-made. Dolphins have no vocal cords, yet they produce a wide range of sounds. The process is pneumatically driven, controlled by the flow of air. Rising to the surface of the ocean, the dolphin exhales, then takes a quick breath. The instant the animal submerges, the blowhole shuts tightly as inhaled air rushes through the nasal passages on its way to the lungs.
The engine that drives sound production is the larynx, a piston-like organ covered by muscles. It controls the flow of air through twin passages in the skull, each sealed by a retractable plug. When the larynx is pushed upward, the nasal plugs automatically open, and air moves freely toward two sets of flaps called the phonic lips. The phonic lips are the main sound generators, and they're designed to work individually or in unison. When the pressurized air hits the lips from below, they vibrate rapidly and produce bursts of the high and low frequency clicks that raise up to 2,000 clicks per second. It's an action that's been compared to the vibrating lips of the trumpet player blowing through the mouthpiece of his instrument. Once air passes through the phonic lips, it is stored in pairs of inflatable sacs. When these sacs are full, they quickly deflate as muscles squeeze the air back down the system, past the open nasal plugs, and back into the lower cavities of the skull. Responding to the change in pressure, the larynx retracts, creating space for the recycled air. When the skull cavity refills, the larynx elevates to increase the air pressure. This triggers the nasal plugs to open, and a new cycle of clicks begins. By recycling the inhaled air, the dolphin can delay having to surface for another breath. That way, it can continue to echolocate for more than 10 minutes. This entire system operates with critical balances and regulation. Every component has to work perfectly within fractions of a second. Okay, so just like we saw in the video, right here, here's the melon, that really distinct part of the head. They're going to send out their signs. They're going to clicks and clicks and stuff. It's going to travel in the form of waves. It's going to hit its object. It's going to bounce back. As it bounces back, it's going to get absorbed by the lower jaw, right? That's going to vibrate. It's going to send a signal to their brain. Um, and this is, again, this is the little acoustic window that's going to vibrate. And it's going to actually send that signal back to them so that they can determine what exactly it is. So if you need to watch that video again, it's a really super helpful and a great little animation. Now, this should not be shocking to you guys that mammals have complex behaviors, right? Chimpanzees, you, dogs, we all have these complex behaviors that we love to go through. Well, so is it true of whales, okay? Whales are actually all mammals. So sometimes they can actually talk to each other. So when it comes to the whales, they have different songs, they have different vocalizations. Pods of dolphins, pods of whales can sometimes have their own languages. So two different pods of dolphins might not be able to talk to each other because they have their own languages. And yes, they do have their own languages. This is some of the problems with um, keeping whales from different pods in captivity is that they can sometimes be sad and unhappy because you, essentially you can't talk to one another. You're like, I have no idea what language you're speaking and so how can you communicate? And it can be very frustrating. So that's kind of like where the whole blackfish thing led into is keeping the orcas in captivity with people People. Whales not from their original family pod because essentially it's like being in a room with a different person from a different country. You can't exactly communicate sometimes, so it can be very frustrating on the whales. Um, for sea lions, sea lions are known to bark. Seals do not bark. They kind of do the groggly thing. It almost sound like Chewbacca, uh, but that was my terrible Chewbacca, by the way. If you can't tell. Uh, but sea lions bark. So if you ever by the ocean and you see hear someone barking, it is not a seal. It is a sea lion. And they will bark for several different reasons. Hey, get away from me. Hey, baby, come over here. Hey, this is my territory. You know, they're just very, very, vo very vocal. Um, so humpback whales, again, will sing to each other. They do this to, um, we're actually not 100% sure why they do this. We know that they do this to communicate with each other, but sometimes they just sing. And you can hear it, like these naval ships will hear it, like when they're, um, you know, these big submarines will be underwater, and then you'll just hear these whale songs. And you're like, what are you singing for? Then again, why do birds sing sometimes? We're not exactly 100% sure yet. Um, they do engage in lots of different play activity. Any kind of animal in captivity, um, especially a mammal, would need some kind of stimulation. Right? Imagine we're all in captivity right now. Huh? We need constant stimulation. They don't have Netflix. So 
So what they do is they will play with each other. They'll sometimes play with other organisms. They'll sometimes play with their food. Sea lions have been known, and dolphins too, to grab their food and kind of toss it around. Killer whales will do that with sea lions and seals. Yeah, which is kind of brutal, but like really kind of interesting. Um, and they will even actually have sex play. I told you guys more fun sex facts about marine biology. Sexual play is common in things like dolphins. Um, yeah, that's pretty much enough said about that one, right? Um, whales do this very common, dolphins do too. This is known as breaching, where they jump out of the water and then boom, land back. Think about when you were a kid and you used to go swimming in your neighbor's pool, right? You used to jump in, why? Just you could get back out and jump in again? Kind of, because it's fun. They do the same kind of thing. A lot of time they're breaching just because it's fun, just because they can, and what else are you gonna do if you're a whale? Um, sometimes it is believed that the breaching is to remove parasites. Remember the barnacles we talked about that are completely covering that whale? That whale can feel those barnacles. I'm sorry, it's not really commensalism. So sometimes they'll roll along the bottom and try to knock them off the sand, or sometimes it is believed that they're jumping and smacking down to kind of knock some of those off. Because you're talking about a several ton whale smashing down into the water. It can actually do some damage. So that's what we believe that these guys are doing sometimes. Um, also sometimes a warning signal, stay away from me, stay away from my baby, I'm gonna jump and potentially come really close to you. That's a lot of times when they come close to the boats and stuff, they know where those boats are. But a lot of times it's kind of, it can, it can be, not always, but it can be like a back off kind of thing. Um, oh, spy hopping is another one, that, that's what this guy is doing right here. Essentially he's popping out of the water and kind of looking around and popping back down. Notice spy hopping, you kind of come out and take a look. What's going on in this little area right here? They're very curious, they're mammals, just like us. We're very curious creatures. And therefore, you know, we want simulation. We want to know what's going on over there. What is that? What is that thing that I've never seen before here in the ocean? It's a person. I'm gonna go check it out. Um, they do, oh, a lot of these guys do very, very long migrations, especially the whales. Some, depending on the species of whales, um, will travel north to go up and have their babies. And some will travel south to go down and have their babies. Sometimes we'll come back to the equators. Um, I believe it's, I think, I'm gonna be, I think it's the humpback goes down to the tropics to have its babies and then up to the poles to feed. And then so depending on what type of year you get these, these uh, migrations. And so they're totally predictable. We know exactly what time of year they're happening. And it's not like they have a calendar. It's all just these environmental cues. And they know, hey, hey, it's getting kind of cold. I'm gonna head down to you know the tropics where it's gonna be nice and warm during the winter so I can have my baby in the spring. Or I'm gonna head up to Alaska during the summer because there's a ton of food up in Alaska. So I'm gonna eat my face off up in Alaska before coming back to have my babies kind of thing. So they do go through migrations depending on the species of whale, which time of year they go up north and which time of year they go south. Um, so again, you can see here, so they're in the summer, they're gonna be feeding up here in the north. Again, lots of food. You don't want to go up there when the water's too, too cold, right? Because it's going to also be pretty treacherous with storms and stuff. And then you want to come down here during the summer months so you can earn the spring months so you can actually pop and have your calves and then take them in the safeties back up north when it's a little bit warmer for them. Um, and there's probably less predators there. So again, depending on the different species, you're going north at different times, you're going south at different times, et cetera. Uh, caregiving is a big one. We know that lots of different um, whales and Sea lions and stuff will actually care for their young. This is where we don't see this in different fishes and stuff, but we do see a lot of parental care when it comes to mammals. Um, in fact, those mass strandings that you guys have maybe heard about where it's like all of a sudden all of these whales are up on the beach, it's really tragic and it absolutely breaks my heart. But what probably happened was one whale was trying to feed and got a little bit close to the shore and got stuck. But because they're such a close family unit, they didn't want to leave him behind, so they all kind of go up to kind of get him, and then they all get stuck. So it's absolutely, it's just heartbreaking to see, but it's because they're such close family units. Um, way back in the day when we were still collecting whales for things like zoos and stuff like that, which we do not do anymore, nor have we done for the last 30 years because we understand that it was wrong. If you took a dolphin or something from its pod, the pod would actually cry, and you could hear them crying and waiting, and they'd pace back and forth, and they're like, no, that's like our family member. So these guys are mammals. They absolutely have emotions, and um, they should be treated, you know, with respect, because they are. They are very intelligent and do have, you know, these close family ties. And if you break up a family, it can be very, very traumatic for them. So uh, that's kind of what happens if the pod, you know, one of them gets sick. They usually kind of all stay with them. 
Um, they won't like kick them out or send them off to die. They, they will try to do everything that they can to stay together as a family unit as a whole um, and stay together, which is you know really heartwarming, actually. Ah, uh, mammal fertilization. You guys should know something about this, right? This is not a sex ed class, but pretty much all mammals do it the same way, right? Through copulation, right? Direct copulation. Um, depending on the different species they mate in different whales, whales will kind of turn and face each other. One will go upside down, the other will go and they kind of mate like that. Um, sea lions will do it on land, um, so will seals and stuff like that. Um, some of them do have uh, harems, remember like the elephant seals we talked about in that video that we watched. They will have harems, so one male will reproduce with all the females until he's beaten out by another larger male, and then he will mate with all the females. The females are like, yeah, whatever, he's protecting me, and I get to mate with someone, so meh but the male kind of controls his population. And usually the largest and the strongest male will get to mate because he essentially has the best genes. And again, the females will be like, yeah, I want my babies to have good genes. I want them to do well, so I'm gonna mate with the biggest and the strongest. Um, some of them use what's called delayed implantation. And that, I think we talked about with sharks for a little bit. So if they're mating and conditions maybe aren't perfect, they will actually wait to fertilize. They'll store the sperm but they won't fertilize the egg. So that's called delayed implantation. So they will wait until conditions are better. Maybe they have more food, maybe they were sick, maybe there was you know, storms around. They will wait until conditions are good and then they will actually fertilize that egg so that they will have a healthy offspring instead of having an offspring when times aren't necessarily good. Because again, parental care, they put a lot of time into this. And gestation periods are long, they're like us. You know, nine, 10 months before you're actually popping out that kid, sometimes longer sometimes up to a year, a year and a half, it's a long time to put into one baby, and therefore you wanna make sure that it's born at the right time and to be as absolutely healthy as you can. Okay. So, just a review of all the vertebrates that we've talked about so far, right? The sea turtles, the sea snakes, the marine iguanas, the saltwater crocodiles, the seabirds, the pinnipeds, the sea otters, the polar bears, the sirenas, the cetaceans, meaning the baleens, and the toothed whales. So this is an amazing chart that will help you guys study if you want to learn how they feed, how they reproduce, whether they're homeotherms or um, endotherm or um, poikiotherms, whatever, this is a really, really great chart to kind of give you guys a guideline of what you should be learning for all of the vertebrates we've talked about so far. All right, all right, but I'm child. I know, terrible dad jokes. Two in one lecture, guys, you're so lucky. All right, well, thanks for sticking with me. Um, I know that this has not been easy. I'm trying to make this as fun as I still possibly can for you guys. I'm sorry some of my videos have been a little bit late. I'm going to try to film a bunch this weekend so that I can get on top of it so that you guys will be able to watch your, um, your lectures during class time. But again, you can really watch this whenever. We are going to have our first live stream coming up soon, so keep an eye out for that. Um, otherwise, guys, I'll be in touch. If you have any questions, please let me know. By the way, this is the last lecture for your upcoming test, test three, I believe. So guys, test three is coming up. Remember, it's focusing on all vertebrates. So all of these vertebrates that I just showed you guys here in this chart, this is what your next test is gonna be on. So make sure that you guys study this. Your next test will be um, next week, so you guys have a little bit of time. And if you have any questions, please, please, please let me know. Okay, thanks guys, and I'll, uh, I'll see you soon.